Kenny McCormick has had one of the strongest and most dynamic evolutions of any character in all of South Park. I've actually been planning to do a full Evolution of Kenny video in the same vein as my Randy Marsh video for a while, but that's a huge undertaking and requires tons of rewatching and research, so while we wait for that, I figured we could talk about something we rarely see from Kenny. Unmuffled, fully comprehensible dialogue. Early in the series, Kenny was mostly used as a punchline, and obviously one of the gags is that his dialogue is fully muffled. But as the series has gone on, they've not only expanded Kenny's role into a more fleshed out character, but granted him the opportunity to actually speak in a variety of different ways. So today, we're going to talk about every time we've heard Kenny McCormick talk. You know, like, properly. Over the first handful of seasons of South Park, Kenny was mostly a punchline. He was obviously a big part of each episode, but he never really felt like a full character rounding out the gang, since most of the time we were just waiting to see how they would kill him in each episode. And I think that this is one of the reasons that his first actual lines of audible dialogue in the series are so impactful. Kenny's death in South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut is the major inciting incident for the entire plot of the film. But this also gives Kenny an entire subplot to himself as he navigates hell and forms a friendship with Satan. They actually tease this plot perfectly earlier in the film, as Kenny leaves home to go see a movie with Stan and the boys, and his mom chastises him for missing church. You go ahead and miss church, and then when you die and go to hell, you can answer to Satan! The South Park movie premiered in the middle of season 3, and so to this point, this was by far the most substantial role that Kenny had ever been given in a South Park story, as he tries to help support Satan through his abusive relationship with Saddam Hussein. You're right, I should leave him. I'm just gonna tell him, Saddam, I'm going to Earth to rule alone. At the climax of the movie, Satan finally takes Kenny's advice and kills Saddam, granting Kenny a single wish as a reward for helping him. Kenny wishes that everything would go back to how it was before Satan came to Earth, meaning he saves his friends, but dooms himself. And this is when we get to see Kenny's face and hear his unmuffled voice for the very first time. Goodbye, you guys. Man, I love this moment. Such a great way to reveal Kenny's face for the first time, and such a lovely, emotional piece of dialogue. They actually teased that this would be the first time we would see and hear Kenny outside of the orange parka in this very first scene of the movie, as he wakes up and we see his hair for the first time before he stuffs himself back into the coat. Man, that's a great movie. Funny enough, the voice actor for Kenny in the film was actually Mike Judge, creator of Beavis and Butthead and King of the Hill, and voice actor for countless characters in each of those shows. I was hesitant to count this next example, but I wanted to give it a shout out regardless. In season six, the show decided decided to keep Kenny dead for an entire season, but eventually Cartman drinks Kenny's ashes, mistaking them for chocolate milk mix. This leaves Kenny's soul in Cartman's body, and so occasionally, Kenny speaks through Cartman. Yeah, luckily Cartman's big enough for the both of us. Shut up, Kenny. But not counting this, we wouldn't actually hear Kenny's unmuffled voice for five years after the South Park movie, until season eight's The Jeffersons. This is the infamous Michael Jackson episode where the kids become really concerned for MJ's son Blanket due to his father's neglect. In order to rescue him, they have Kenny disguise himself as Blanket and swap places with them. Thanks a lot for helping us, dude. Yeah, sure, whatever. You just gotta pretend you're Blanket until we can get the real Blanket somewhere safe. Aren't I too big to be blanket? I remember watching this for the first time and it feeling so out of nowhere. After years of just never showing Kenny out of his costume, they kind of just do it. But it is handled pretty funny. All right, but you guys owe me for this. Dude, whatever, at least you finally get to do something. Unfortunately, this ends tragically in a typical Kenny fashion as MJ mistakes him for blanket. No, 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 wait, I'm not blanket. Wee, he can fly, he can ah! fly. Ah, stop! The next time we hear Kenny's voice isn't until season 11's Lice Capades. I remember for years that this was an episode people really hated, but man, I always thought this premise was genius. Showcasing the elimination of lice from the lice's perspective, like it's some kind of apocalyptic event, it's really clever. But the non-lice-centric story involves the kids becoming obsessed with trying to learn who had the lice in their class, assuming it was Kenny. In their assumptions, they strip Kenny down and force a sock bath on him. And as they begin, we can hear him protest. <laughs> Not the clearest line, but certainly clearer than his usual muffled dialogue. The episode actually ends with everyone admitting that they all had lice, so it makes their force clean of Kenny that much more selfish. During some of this final dialogue, we can actually see parts of Kenny's face behind Craig, but just barely. And they end up sock bathing him anyway because he also technically lied. Kids are real assholes sometimes. Interestingly, the next time we hear clear dialogue from Kenny was actually not confirmed to be Kenny until an entire season later. In season 13's The Coon, Cartman tries desperately to become a real life superhero and has have people take him seriously. Unfortunately for Cartman, another hero appears and is instantly taken very seriously. This hero being Mysterion. Ah, Mysterion, thank God you've come. 
What news do you have? There's some graffiti on the bridge again, and the guy at the movie theater is harassing Mexicans again. The entire episode revolves around Cartman and the rest of the kids not knowing Mysterion's identity, and him eventually choosing to reveal that identity to the world to protect the citizens of South Park. However, the big reveal is also played as a joke, as Mysterion reveals his face without saying who he is. Obviously, a hilarious thing to do in South Park, where 90% of the kids have the exact same face. The entire town vaguely reacts in shock with hints to his identity, but no confirmation. I knew it was you! Remember, I even said it before! Wow, a kid from my class was Mysterion. But, of course, the confirmation that Kenny is Mysterion wouldn't come until season 14's Coon and French trilogy. In these episodes, all of the kids wear costumes, and they sort of slowly reveal the identities of each kid over the course of the episodes. I'm sure many figured out that Kenny was Mysterion before they say it, but the second episode of the trilogy, Mysterion Rises, reveals it explicitly. And that he actually has a superpower. What? What is your power? I can't die. I've said before how much I love this reveal and how I think it makes Kenny a much more dynamic character in retrospect, and obviously this entire trilogy and the other superhero themed episodes all feature tons of unmuffled dialogue from Kenny in the form of Mysterion, though he is obviously disguising his voice in the gravelly Batman-esque tone. There is a great moment though where he breaks, when he discovers that his parents were arrested for being members of a cult. What the fuck? I, I mean, <laughs> what the fuck? So, even though most of these episodes aren't featuring Kenny's real voice, we do at least get this one moment. Mysterion is featured in The Coon, Coon 2 Hidesight, Mysterion Rises, Coon vs. Coon and Friends, The Poor Kid, Franchise Prequel, and of course, The Fractured But Whole video game. So, if you're looking for tons of unmuffled Kenny dialogue, these are all great places to start. My personal favorite is The Poor Kid, which features Mysterion, but none of the other superhero personas. Kenny dons the costume and acts as a guardian angel for his little sister after she and Kenny were put into foster care. The idea of Kenny using a superhero persona specifically to help and protect his sister is really really wholesome, and I think a really great piece of development for Kenny as a character. But I'm all alone now. You are not alone. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, I will always be here. They also imply that this is not the first time he's helped Karen as Mysterion. I'm a huge, huge fan of this episode. They also sort of follow up this relationship in the Fractured But Whole DLC, From Dusk Till Casa Bonita, where the new kid and Mysterion try to save Karen from the vamp kids at Casa Bonita. The next time we actually get to hear Kenny clearly is in another of my favorite episodes, A Nightmare on FaceTime. Stan, Kyle, Cartman, and Kenny plan to dress up as the Avengers for Halloween, though Stan is forced to work at Randy's new blockbuster, and they have to FaceTime Stan into their trick-or-treating via iPad. However, Kenny is Iron Man. Man, and he basically talks the entire episode through a voice modulator. Stan and Kyle, you take the back entrance. Carbon and I will block him from the side. This sequence was really funny, where the kids try to stop some actual burglars at the convenience store. I always laugh really hard at Kenny's delivery here. Holy shit, they shot this guy! Oh my god! Dude, fuck this, let's bail! I really love this example of Kenny dialogue, just really fun and creative stuff in this episode. The most recent and final time that we've heard unmuffled Kenny dialogue is in season 23's Turd Burglars, a pretty gross episode, as the title might suggest. It's all about the kids trying to steal Tom Brady's turds for fecal transplants because of his perfect microbiome. They've been promised copies of Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order if they can make it happen. The episode is also this weird Dune parody, with Brady's crap being referred to as the Spice Melange. In order to get into Brady's house, House, they pretend Kenny is a dying Patriots fan there to meet Tom, and for a moment while hearing all the kids' thoughts, we can hear Kenny's thoughts unmuffled. Why did I agree to this? I don't even have a machine to play Fallen Order on. And, for now, that is the last time we've heard Kenny clearly in any South Park media. I appreciate that they tend to do this very sparingly, and often very creatively and with good reason. Some of these episodes are my favorites in the series, and I think Kenny's sacrifice in the movie is probably one of my favorite South Park moments of all time. I really love a good Kenny-focused episode, and I really hope that we get more of them soon. If you want a full list of episodes where we can hear Kenny's voice, here they are in release order. The movie, South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, Season 8, Episode 6, The Jeffersons, Season 11, Episode 3, Lice Capades, Season 13, Episode 2, The Coon, Season 14, Episodes 11 through 13, The Coon and Friends Trilogy, Season 15, Episode 14, The Poor Kid, Season 16, Episode 12, A Nightmare on FaceTime, Season 21, Episode 4, Franchise Prequel, The Game, South Park the Fractured But Whole, and Season 23, Episode 8, Turd Burglars. And there you go. I love Kenny, so stay tuned. I will do that full character evolution video on him relatively soon. I really just want to do him justice. Alright, peace. 
For my money, no character in South Park history has had a journey and evolution as satisfying as Kenny McCormick. The character started as a one-note punchline who was killed in every single episode, to briefly being killed off permanently, and before you knew it, with some smart writing and creative narrative maneuvering, Kenny became a genuinely complex and compelling character. He went from basically being too thin to use in any substantial way, to having arguably the most nuanced and tragic backstory, a character with a great heart and true pathos. So, as I previously promised in my Every Time Kenny Talks video, today, let's take a look at the complete evolution of the immortal child, Kenny McCormick. Oh my god, they killed Kenny! Yeah! So, as I mentioned, Kenny's first couple of years on South Park were not really spent exploring him as an actual character. With his trademark muffled dialogue that can only sometimes be understood, and the fact that he was killed in new ways every single episode, he was basically just a joke, meant for punchlines and not much else. In the first season alone, Kenny dies 13 times, run over by Barb Brady, crushed by a prop during the school play, impaled on a flagpole in an assassination attempt on Kathy Lee Gifford, accidentally shot by Ned, decapitated during a football game, microwaved to death, touched by literally death himself, crushed by a space station, revived as a zombie in that same episode and then chainsawed in half by Kyle, shot by Jimbo after he was turned into a duck-billed platypus by the son of Satan, killed by mutant turkeys, stabbed to the wall by a scimitar, wrapped and strangled by a tetherball rope, and run over by a train in an incident that would win the grand prize on America's stupidest home videos. As you can see, just a huge variety of ways for Kenny to die. And of course, each death is always followed by the iconic catchphrase from Stan and Kyle. Oh my god, they killed Kenny! Oh my god, they've killed Kenny! Oh my god, they've killed Kenny! You bastards! You bastards! You bastards! There are a few smaller things in season one that give a tiny bit more of a look into his eventual journey. Mr. Hanky the Christmas Poo in particular was the one episode early on where Kenny survived, and in retrospect, it gave our first small hints that Kenny was aware of his persistent death. Over the course of the episode, Kenny is asked to do a series of incredibly dangerous things, and he's clearly concerned about each and every one. And then when the episode ends, he very clearly acknowledges that he has skirted death for once. It seems like something's still not right. Yeah, something feels unfinished. <laughs> season 2 largely treats Kenny the same way as Season 1. There are like 19 more deaths, some as violent as having his head bitten off by Ozzy Osbourne, and some as chill as dying in a hospital bed from chicken pox. And though these seasons didn't explore Kenny as thoroughly as the other characters, we do learn a lot about his home life and his place in South Park. We meet his parents, Carol and Stuart McCormick, as well as his older brother Kevin, though he has very limited screen time and only like three total episodes with a speaking role. My waffles did! My waffles did! We also learn that Kenny is the poorest kid in town. The boys are actually really mean to Kenny about this. Yellow Mega Man is only $8.95, so maybe your mom can put it on layaway and make payments for a year or two. <laughs> Kenny's house has a different design than the others in South Park and is much more run down, and he's persistently shown to have older or less nice things than the other boys. We don't have a Nintendo. We got a ColecoVision plugged into the black and white TV. But for the most part, Kenny was just along for the ride with the other boys in most of these misadventures, occasionally piping in with a muffled line, often to comedic effect, and always dying somehow. It wasn't really until season three that Kenny would start to get a more substantial focus as an actual protagonist, with the first real instance being the season three premiere, Rainforest Schmain Forest. And it would also establish a long-running character trait that makes him stand out from the other boys. He's very interested in girls and dating, seemingly in a just much more impassioned way than Stan, Kyle, or Eric. The episode starts with a choir called Getting Gay with Kids coming to South Park to talk about their work to save the rainforest. <laughs> but even though Kenny thinks the group sounds lame, he instantly becomes enamored with a girl in the group named Kelly, and because of the kids' bad behavior, they're all sent with the choir to save the rainforest. While we know that all of Kenny's friends understand him very easily, Kelly is one of the first characters in South Park to acknowledge his muffled dialogue. Lenny? Lenny? Johnny? Oh. Over their time spent in the rainforest, Kenny and Kelly get really close, and Kelly develops feelings for Kenny, though she doesn't want to act on them. Once this choir tour is over, we'll never see each other again. And that would devastate me, so I can't have any feelings for you. I just can't, Lenny. But through the chaos and danger of their rainforest misadventures, Kenny wins over Kelly. He even jumps in front of her to protect her from gunfire, a moment that in hindsight would really foreshadow a lot of Kenny's future development. And at the end of the episode, Kelly and Kenny decide to long distance date. Although, they decide this moments before disaster strikes. We'll have to call each other every other day. Okay, okay, okay. Ah! Lenny, no! 
<laughs> but amazingly, for the first time in the entire series, Kelly decides to actually try to help Kenny instead of just yell about the bastard who killed him. No one's ever tried this, and it actually works. <coughs> Whoa, dude! Kenny would survive this episode after being revived by Kelly, a very rare occurrence, so this episode marked a couple major milestones for Kenny. His willingness to sacrifice his own well-being for Kelly would hint at some of the major character turns we would see from Kenny later in the series. It shows the first of a few times where Kenny throws himself into a relationship, and also one of the first times a character takes Kenny's death seriously, leading to his immediate revival. The next time Kenny got the spotlight is still to this day one of his biggest and most emotionally affecting stories, and it was actually in the South Park movie, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut which released in the middle of season 3. I honestly still need to make a video dedicated to that movie as a whole, but let's just talk about Kenny's incredible arc here. Kenny's death in South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut is actually the major inciting incident for the entire plot of the film. After the kids see asses of fire in theaters, Kenny tries to light his fart on fire and nearly burns to death, though the thing that actually kills him is the doctor, played by George Clooney. Son, I have some bad news. We accidentally replaced your heart with a baked potato. You have about three seconds to live. But for the first time in the series, they show Kenny's experience moving into the afterlife, unfortunately being rejected from heaven and sent straight to hell. They tease this subplot perfectly earlier in the film as Kenny leaves home to go see a movie with Stan and the boys and his mom chastises him for missing church. You go ahead and miss church, and then when you die and go to hell, you can answer to Satan! And though Kenny is initially tortured by Satan, for the majority of the movie, he actually tries to help support Satan through his abusive relationship with Saddam Hussein. What is this fucking evil? You're right. I should leave him. I'm just gonna tell him, Saddam, I'm going to Earth to rule alone. This all culminates in the most perfect climax. After Satan and Saddam start to storm the Earth, Satan finally takes Kenny's advice and kills his abusive boyfriend, granting Kenny a single wish as a reward for helping him. Kenny wishes that everything would go back to how it was before Satan came to Earth, meaning he saves his friends, but he sacrifices himself. Kenny, you realize that means you'd go back too. Uh -huh. Kenny even gets his first ever I learned something today speech, though it's too muffled to quite make out what he says. After this, Kenny removes his hood and reveals his fully uncovered face for the first time in South Park history. Goodbye, you guys. This entire film is incredible, but just like Rainforest Main Forest, this is another huge story that would set important precedents for Kenny as a character. Through his subplot with Satan, we see how caring and empathetic Kenny can be as he helps Satan navigate a really difficult situation, and we once again see his willingness to risk his own well-being for the good of his friends and the world through his sacrifice at the end of the film. These will be huge through lines in his character journey. The last episode in Season 3 that really puts a spotlight on Kenny is Jubilee, the third of the Meteor Shower trilogy. Sadly, Kenny Kenny doesn't have anywhere to go on the night of the meteor shower, so even though he isn't Jewish, Kyle invites him to Jew Scouts with him. At first, Kenny is pretty rude and writes off Kyle's beliefs. This is where we all stand in a circle and pray to Moses for guidance during Jubilee. <laughs> But he very quickly realizes he shouldn't have been so quick to judge, especially when Moses appears. That's Moses, stupid! Unfortunately for Kenny, Moses realizes he isn't Jewish, and the Jew Scout leaders force him to leave the ceremony. But despite this, Kenny actually ends up returning to the camp to rescue everyone there. When one of the Scout leaders captures Moses in a conch shell and starts to summon the evil Haman, Kenny literally kills himself in order to crack open the conch shell and free Moses. Kenny, no! Kenny once again sacrifices himself to save others, even people who had just banished him from their group. He saved us. He saved all the Jews. So, with just a few stories focusing on Kenny so far, there's a very clear pattern emerging. Though, in Season 4, they would move a bit further away from this early pattern and move more into some other directions for Kenny, many of which in some way relate to the fact that he's poor. In the episode Quintuplets, Kenny realizes that he's actually an incredibly talented singer. <laughs> Kenny wants the opportunity to become a successful singer, but is told that it will never happen unless he goes to a conservatory in Europe, a tall task for his poor family. Kenny and his mother end up singing their way to Europe, street performing to make the money on the way, and he actually successfully gets into a Romanian conservatory, becoming a huge success in the process. I really love seeing Kenny showered in roses and cheers at the theater, it's nice to see him get a win. They even ask him to stay in Romania. You'd have to leave your friends and your family behind. So, Alright! Of course, Kenny is tragically killed by the US government at the end of this one, 
on. In the very next episode, Cartman joins Nambla. Kenny's parents give him some very distressing news. Kenny, your dad and I are thinking about having another baby. Wouldn't you like to have another brother or sister? Kenny ends up having full-on nightmares about what this might mean for him, including one where his new brother is just an actual little monster. So Kenny spends the entire remainder of the episode trying to stop this from happening. He hits his dad in the balls, tries to give his mom a morning after pill cocktail, which his dad drinks, and he takes them both on a very dangerous roller coaster, which once again just injures Stuart instead. Eventually, he just fully tries to get rid of the baby himself. It's a lot. A few episodes later, in Fat Camp, Kenny starts to eat really gross stuff and just do gross stunts for money. He eats a manatee spleen, spends four days in a porta potty, tons of gross stuff. This eventually lands him his own reality TV show. They really lean into the desperate nature of the McCormick's financial struggles. And if I'm being honest, these episodes feel like a bit of a detour for Kenny's development. Though it would obviously get back on track eventually. I definitely understand where the humor stems from in these plot lines for Kenny, but there are just a few things that feel a tiny bit out of character. Kenny's so quick writing off his family and friends in Romania doesn't quite feel like the Kenny who sacrificed himself for those same friends back in the movie. The lengths Kenny goes to stop his parents from getting pregnant feels like one of the most fully selfish things he's ever done in the show, and it feels especially weird after some of the later stuff they do with Kenny's little sister, who had yet to be introduced at this point. Though there are definitely other aspects that set up some finer details about Kenny that would be fleshed out even more later. The fact that Kenny cannot die would definitely make his willingness to put himself in very dangerous and disgusting situations make more sense. Even though those things could still kill him, he dies all the time, so the risk isn't as great, it's a way for him to actually make a little money for his family. The end of Cartman Joins Nambla also establishes the first ever acknowledgement from Kenny's parents that he dies a lot. When Kenny is killed at the end of the episode, Carol gives birth to their new baby, who they then decide to name Kenny. A brand new Kenny! God, this must be the 50th time this has happened. While this was obviously played as a meta joke here, it will actually come into play in a pretty meaningful way later. And while Kenny's parents acknowledge his constant deaths here, we see a bit more from Kenny about how frustrating it is for him that his friends don't acknowledge his deaths. In Cherokee Hair Tampons, when Kyle gets really sick and almost dies, Stan has an extremely hard time with it, breaking down about how he can't bear the thought of his friend dying, which obviously upsets Kenny, since he dies all the time. <laughs> Season 5 would also play into Kenny's immature sense of humor as well. The episode How to Eat With Your Butt shows Kenny put his parka on upside down for a school photo, making it look like he has a butt for a face, which of course makes a couple who has a genetic condition giving them butts for faces think that they might have found their long lost son. And all the while, Kenny has of course just continued to be a big part of the boys' games and adventures. He tries to help them run their tooth fairy scheme to make money, he's a member of their boy band, he tries to help them reunite Terrence and Philip. pretty much everything they do, Kenny is there. And of course, he continued to die die brutally in countless new ways. Drowned in a river, crushed by an elevator, sacrificed to a John Elway statue when the kids start a Lord of the Flies-esque society, killed by the US government in Afghanistan. They would even just fully torture him in some episodes, like in Terrence and Philip behind the blow when Earth Day activists cut off every one of his limbs to scare them into reuniting Terrence and Philip. Pretty brutal. But none of these had the kinds of impact that Kenny's death would have at the end of season 5 in an episode aptly titled Kenny Dies. This can't happen! Kitty can't die! After feeling that the character was too one note to fully utilize, and becoming tired of thinking of ways to kill him, Matt and Trey decided to kill off Kenny permanently. But unlike his usual deaths, in this one, Kenny gets a terminal disease, and the episode focuses on the boys going through the stages of grief, realizing that their friend is going to die. Kitty can't die! Kitty can't die! <laughs> Honestly, this entire episode is so, so sad. There isn't a single other episode in the show's entire history that takes this tone. They really lean into how devastated these kids are. Even Cartman is torn up about it, and he gets this really lovely moment with Kenny, talking to him about how Stan and Kyle are best friends. I kind of always thought you were my best friend. I don't know. My god, what an absolutely devastating send-off for Kenny. Cartman even gets stem cell research unbanned so he can try to save him, and the entire time Stan is incapable of grappling with the reality that his friend is going to die. He refuses to see him in the hospital because it hurts too much, and when he finally goes to say goodbye, it's too late. Did he say anything before he went? He just said, 
Where's Stan? Uh, and as much as it hurts, I'm kind of happy to see Kenny get such an emotional send-off. The poor kid goes through so much, so he kind of deserves this impactful moment. And though they killed off Kenny to make way for characters that they felt they could utilize better, like Butters or Tweak, I think over the following season, not having Kenny around actually made Matt and Trey realize that he's a core part of the group, and that there's more they could have been doing with him. He's not really replaceable. One of the biggest aspects of Season 6 is the boys struggle to replace Kenny in their group, initially bringing in Butters, but firing him because he's too lame, and eventually holding a full-on competition-style reality show to find their ideal fourth friend for the group. A later episode, Ladder to Heaven, has the boys trying to get to heaven to see Kenny again so they can get back their winning ticket for a free candy shopping spree. In this episode, Cartman drinks Kenny's ashes, thinking they're chocolate milk mix, and then Kenny shares Cartman's body for a few episodes. I'm not sharing my body with that poor piece of crap. Stop calling me poor, you fat dick! Eventually, Kenny is exercised from Cartman's body and moved into a pot roast, which was eaten by Rob Schneider, who then stars in a movie about Kenny's life. So many episodes in season six just become about the void that Kenny left behind with his death, and it feels like not only the characters were reconciling with it, but the writers as well, which is why I think they just decided to bring Kenny back at the end of the year. They missed him. Hey, Dave, what's going on? Oh, hey, Kenny. Dude, where have you been? After this, how South Park used Kenny changed pretty substantially. They stopped killing him every episode, instead opting just to kill him when the opportunity arose or when it made sense narratively. They also continued to lean into some character traits that made him stand out in the older episodes, even in his smaller roles. In the very next episode, Season 7's Cancelled, Kenny is the one who takes the photo of the alien producers of Earth, allowing the kids to blackmail them so that they don't cancel the show, slash, their lives. Kenny's small action here ended up saving the entire planet. In Season 8's The Jeffersons, we see and hear Kenny out of his parka for the first time since the movie, he pretends to be Mr. Jefferson's son Blanket so that they can rescue the real Blanket. Honestly, Stan is kind of mean to Kenny here. All right, but you guys owe me for this. Dude, whatever, at least you finally get to do something. This is obviously a meta joke about Kenny's role in the show, but it's still gotta hurt Kenny to hear this, especially because he is once again putting his well-being at risk to help out another kid. So often, even in his smaller roles and episodes, Kenny is helping people. And this was definitely the case in the season nine episode, Best Friends Forever, the first major Kenny episode after his return at the end of season six. In this one, Kenny is the first kid in town to get a PSP, much to Cartman's chagrin, and he's incredible at the game he got for it, Heaven vs. Hell. But as it turns out, the PSP and the game Heaven vs. Hell were created by God to recruit the perfect tactician in an actual battle between Heaven vs. Hell. So when Kenny is the first to reach level 60, he goes to Heaven to help battle the armies of darkness. What the fuck is going on? Heaven needs you. Unfortunately, Kenny's dead body is revived into a vegetative state after his death, removing him from heaven, but also making him incapable of doing anything on Earth. And even worse, Kenny is basically used as a prop in a personal beef between Cartman and Stan slash Kyle. Kenny leaves Cartman as PSP, but because he doesn't die, Cartman campaigns to have Kenny's feeding tube removed so he can die with dignity, but more importantly, so Cartman can get the PSP. And Stan and Kyle campaign to keep Kenny alive, but not because they actually think it's the right thing to do, they do it because they just don't want Cartman to take advantage of the situation just to get a damn PSP. So while Kenny is supposed to be fighting an important battle between good and evil, he is instead trapped in the middle of a national debate that's being broadcast on TV, a debate that ultimately isn't actually about him or what's best for him. It's kind of a strong metaphor for the way the show treated Kenny for years, a character with real substance, mostly used as a prop. Of course, I think everyone got a strong reality check from this one. The end of the episode sees Kenny's lawyer discover the final page of his will that stipulates what he wants if he's ever in a vegetative state. For the love of God, don't ever show me in that condition on national television. So they eventually let Kenny die with dignity, and he's able to help the forces of heaven fight the forces of hell. Sadly, almost everyone in Kenny's life seems to look down on or talk down to him in some way. We saw Stan do it in the Jeffersons, the boys historically rip on him for being poor, and he even gets it from his mother in this one. If you died tomorrow, what would you have to show for it? But the great irony is obviously that Kenny is truly one of the most selfless characters in South Park. He sacrificed himself for the good of the world and and his friends multiple times, which is why I think the route they go with Kenny in season 12's major boobage sadly makes a lot of sense. Kenny is a character who has been persistently traumatized over and over through his countless deaths. He has an abusive home life, is ripped on by his friends for being the poorest kid in town, and he generally just has the toughest life out of pretty much every kid in South Park. So it didn't really surprise me when they had him get hooked on drugs in this episode. Granted, the drugs are cat pee, and I really have a hard time watching this episode because it really grosses me out, but I actually think this development tracks really well with Kenny's evolution. He has a hard life and he turns to escapism. And that escapism also plays into Kenny's girl obsession because when he cheeses, he hallucinates this woman that he is very attracted to. 
Kenny also, as we've established, likely feels less of a risk when these kinds of decisions because of his immortality, so this all tracks. I will say, it was nice to see his friends actually be concerned for Kenny's well-being in this one, which is obviously something that comes and goes depending on the storyline. This marked a bit of what I felt was a transitional period for Kenny. Over season 13 and 14, he only gets a couple of episodes that focus on him specifically, mostly focusing on his interest in girls and the fact that he's poor. In season 13's The Ring, he starts dating Tammy Warner, and while the boys try to warn Kenny because they think that she's a quote-unquote whore, this is actually what excited Kenny. However, she's then coerced into wearing a purity ring, and they end up like an old married couple for the duration of the episode. Season 14's sexual healing uses him in more of an inciting incident. When he, Kyle, and Butters are diagnosed with sex addiction, Kenny is then pretty explicitly told about autoerotic asphyxiation and how good it feels, so of course, he ends up trying it himself and dying. The episode Poor and Stupid shows him get really angry at Cartman for making a mockery of NASCAR. He nearly dies trying to stop him, and it's nice to see Kenny get a little bit of focus here, but it wasn't too substantial character-wise. This entire period between Kenny's return in Season 6 and his next major turn seems to tackle Kenny from all of the usual angles. He's along for the ride on almost all of the boys' adventures, including the metrosexual fad, playing Warcraft, the wrestling league, but they don't push Kenny's development forward until Season 14, in an episode that, ironically, makes you look backward at Kenny's entire history and see it all differently. Who exactly is Mysterion? Season 14's Coon and Friends trilogy revealed the biggest lore bomb in Kenny history, and arguably in South Park history, and it completely recontextualized everything about the character. I have admittedly in this video been talking about Kenny through the first half of the show with this knowledge and using it to flesh out this analysis, but the reality is that a lot of what we know about Kenny is thanks to this major reveal. In Season 14's Mysterion Rises, we learn that the mysterious superhero Mysterion has been Kenny all along, and this first reveal really only recontextualizes the season 13 episode, The Coon, and re-watching it, it makes so much sense. For years, we have had all of these smaller examples of Kenny wanting to help people, putting his life on the line and putting others before himself in so many different ways. And though the episode The Coon never revealed that Mysterion was Kenny, looking back, it is so obvious that it couldn't have been anybody else. I'm an angel keeping watch over the city at night. And he is the perfect foil to Cartman, who only wants to be a superhero for the glory and cool factor. Kenny is the one who actually wants to help people. The city needs my help. They're innocents to protect. This is such a fun way to expand on the things that have worked so well about Kenny throughout the history of the show. Taking his penchant for helping others and turning it into a bigger, ongoing persona, one that will also allow him to talk more freely than we've ever seen. But the bigger aspect of the lore bomb is of course the reveal in Mysterion Rises that Kenny has an actual superpower. What is your power? I can't die. This is the first time that Kenny explicitly reveals to anyone that he is aware of his persistent deaths, and that it's something that deeply, deeply affects him. He explains that he's died countless times, that sometimes he sees heaven, sometimes he sees hell, but he always wakes up in his bed eventually. And the worst part, nobody even remembers me dying. I go to school the next day, and everyone is just like... Oh, hey, Kenny. This explicit reveal changes so much about how we see Kenny. It elevates the entire history of the show, using him as a punchline and a prop by turning it into trauma. It's one of the smartest and most masterful reveals in TV history, in my opinion. And it makes Kenny's empathy and good-hearted nature that much more impressive because he is clearly the character who has gone through more than anybody in South Park history, dying countless times in the most brutal ways imaginable, a curse and a burden that he's forced to carry alone. Going through these things could have made him cynical and jaded, he could have used his powers in entirely selfish ways, and it would be hard to blame him after being forced to endure all of this trauma. But instead, Kenny is usually the most selfless character in the show. And in these Coon and Friends episodes, it leads Kenny to try and learn more about this curse. And I actually believe that I've uncovered a major aspect of Kenny's immortality that I haven't really seen anyone else talk about. While researching Cthulhu, Kenny discovers that his parents used to attend cult meetings and he confronts them about this. I also love that his confrontation here reveals that Kenny had used his Mysterion persona previously to make his home life better for himself and for his siblings. We did what you told us. 
we treat our kids better we don't beat each other up as much. But Kenny confronts his parents about the Cult of Cthulhu meetings that they attended 10 years prior, but they claim that they only went for free beer and they were too drunk to remember what actually happened at them. At the end of the trilogy, Kenny doesn't get any concrete answers and then he kills himself in front of his friends, which then cuts to his parents, revealing that when Kenny dies, his mother immediately gives birth to him again. Something sort of hinted at back in Cartman Joins Nambla, though that was showcased slightly differently. But Kenny's parents then put the baby Kenny back in his bed, and he seemingly ages back to nine years old overnight. We should have never gone to that stupid cult meeting. On the audio commentaries for these episodes, Trey Parker mentioned this. There's one part in this show that's not spoken, that's sort of a hidden thing that reveals a bit more of what is actually going on, if, if you look for it. With Kenny? Yeah. And after digging through the episode, I think that this is what Trey was referring to. It depicts a group of hooded figures surrounding a baby in a sort of summoning circle, clearly performing some kind of ritual. The only thing that Henrietta says about it is this. Cthulhu and other beings are from this city, but for years cultists have tried to bring them into our world. So this is depicting some kind of ritual to attempt to bring beings from the sunken city to our world. But unmentioned is the baby. Kenny's parents were arrested 10 years prior to this at those cult meetings, which puts the time frame that they were actively attending the meetings right around the time of Kenny's birth. I expect that the ritual depicted in the Necronomicon was actually performed with a baby Kenny while his parents were blackout drunk at one of these meetings. The question is, did the ritual itself and its connection to the sunken city place the curse of immortality onto Kenny? Or is it possible that a being from the lost city actually did cross over and inhabited Kenny's body and was then raised as this human child? It could also explain why Kenny's soul was able to be transferred into Cartman back in season six. I wonder if they'll ever follow this up or not, or if it'll just remain a cool little background detail. Assuming I got any of that right, maybe Trey was referring to something entirely different, but I have a feeling I'm onto something. This is actually another trilogy of episodes I want to do a dedicated video on one day, but it is filled with so many great Kenny moments, especially after the reveal that he experiences and remembers all of his deaths. And ultimately, it's really sad for him, never learning anything substantial about his origins or his curse, with Mintberry Crunch taking the spotlight at the end. But that didn't stop Kenny from continuing to use his superhero persona for the good of others. Season 15's The Poor Kid, in particular, is probably my favorite Mysterion appearance, with the reveal that he has continued to use his alter ego to help his family, this time his younger sister, Karen. Karen was introduced back in Best Friends Forever as a background character, and this was her first real substantial role. Kenny and his siblings are put into foster care when his parents are arrested, and Karen has an incredibly hard time adjusting. But who shows up to help her? Mysterion. I was wondering when you'd appear. You always come when I'm sad. I truly love the idea that Kenny acts as Karen's guardian angel when she needs him through Mysterion. Kenny is a great brother, but the fact that he uses his alter ego to not just fight for her by beating up her bullies, but also talking her through these difficult situations, it's really touching. But I'm all alone now. You are not alone. No matter where you go, no matter what you do. I will always be here. Kenny's relationship with his sister is one of my favorite expansions to his character, and I hope we get more of this in the future. In season 19's The City Part of Town, the area where the McCormicks live is gentrified and turned into a hip spot called Soto Sopa, which completely interrupts their lives and dries up their cost of living. To help out, Kenny gets a job at CityWalk, but after his dad is really shitty towards him and his siblings, Kenny decides to use the money for something else instead. This is mine? Come on, come on. After Soda Sopa falls apart and the area becomes more dangerous, Kenny and Tolkien dress up as ninjas to scare away vagrants, Also, Kenny can protect his family. Just about every major Kenny appearance in this era has some underlying aspect where Kenny's good-hearted nature shines through. In season 16's Going Native, Butters even reveals that the only person he respects at all is Kenny. The only kid here with any sense of dignity is Kenny, and the rest of you have your heads up your butts! Kenny ends up helping all of the, uh quote-unquote native Hawaiians in this episode by bringing them a lost stock of chichi ingredients. Though these people actually suck pretty hard since they aren't actually native Hawaiians, just tourists who have basically set up in Hawaii permanently. But I like Kenny's willingness to help Butters in this episode a lot. In season 18's Cock Magic, when the kids discover the underground Magic the Gathering tournaments where roosters face off against one another, Kenny's main concern is for the poor roosters. And when their rooster, McNuggets, is poised to face off against Gadnog Breaker of Worlds, Kenny takes his place and plays him instead. I know that sounds silly, but Gadnog literally killed the rooster right before this. Kenny was putting himself in actual danger. And at the end of the episode, Kenny was still not concerned for himself. He was concerned for his rooster. I guess I was 
The only episodes in this era that I don't quite know how to fit into this development is the Black Friday trilogy, where Kenny role plays as Princess Kenny for the duration of the PS4 vs Xbox One conflict between the kids. I guess it could be seen as more escapism, which I don't blame Kenny for. He definitely sounds like he would need it every so often, given his ridiculously traumatic life. He's clearly meant to be a Daenerys Game of Thrones parody here. He does a lot of backstabbing and side swapping in his role as Princess Kenny. But there's one episode that I think not only encapsulates Kenny as a person, but also sets up the next big piece of development for his role in the show, and that's season 22's Halloween episode, The Scoots. When all the kids decide to use the new e-scooters on Halloween so they can cover more ground and get more candy, Kenny is left out because he doesn't have a cell phone to be able to activate the scooters. And man, the boys telling Kenny that he's gonna be left out of the trick-or-treating is so freaking sad. I mean, if we're waiting for you, we're gonna be as slow as all the other kids. It's just like, you know what? Cool. Because of how genuine and sweet Kenny is, this hurts even more. Everyone abandons him because he can't ride an e-scooter. And when the influx of more kids on scooters for Halloween sends the town into chaos, Kenny teams up with Mr. Mackey to destroy the cell phone tower, get rid of the scooters, and save the town from being destroyed. Mackey actually makes some really poignant observations on Kenny's role in the show and his characterization here. I know we kind of all forget about you sometimes, but you're smart, compassionate, you might even make a good counselor someday. It's nice to see a character directly say these things about Kenny. He is such a good-natured kid, and he deserves more than he gets. He even puts his life in danger again in this episode to take out the cell phone tower. And honestly, though they don't explicitly say it, I'm pretty confident that Kenny dies in the cell phone tower collapse. I don't see how he could have survived it. But this episode is such a great transitional story, because even at the end, when Kenny inarguably helps the town, his friends are not happy about it, just because they didn't get as much candy as they wanted. It showcases cases not only Kenny's best traits, but also the fact that his friends have started to take him for granted. And soon, that becomes one of the biggest and most central problems in South Park history. Your friends are all kind of douchebags. At the end of the vaccination special, Stan, Kyle, and Cartman decide that they don't want to be friends anymore. However, through this entire ordeal, they completely patronize Kenny and take him for granted. Kenny, you want to go get on your iPad for a minute? What? No, I want to hold us! As they break up their friend group, they treat Kenny like a child that they have to share custody of, and not like one of their best friends who has been there for them in countless ways throughout their entire life. What are you guys talking about? Everything's gonna be okay, Kenny. I'll see you on Monday. And I'll come pick you up on Thursday, Kenny. Huh? To them, he's not a friend, he's an obstacle. A problem that they have to deal with sometimes. Oh, wait, I can't! I have Kenny this weekend! Shit! And the way they treat Kenny here alters the course of history forever. In the post-COVID specials that take place 40 years in the future, Kenny is a scientist and a humanitarian. A genuine genius. McCormick was a pioneer of science and technology who was always trying to unlock the key to a better future. I think after everything we've seen from Kenny's development as a character, it should not be any surprise at all that this was how Kenny spent his life. But when he mysteriously dies, the boys get back together for the first time since they split their friend group to try and figure out what happened to him. And when they finally uncover Kenny's secret data, they learn the sad truth. Kenny resented them for his entire life because they broke up their friend group without his input. He was researching how to go back in time to stop the boys from breaking up their group. He spent his whole life trying to fix your broship and then realized this was the only way because you guys suck. I love what Kyle says here after they learn this fact, realizing what it is that they need to do because it sounds like the most Kenny-influenced line imaginable. What we should have done then was double down on our respect and our love for one another and fight through it instead of fighting with each other. In the end of these specials, the boys manage to go back in time and help get their younger selves back together by sending them to a Denver Nuggets game. They have a blast together and completely renew their friendship. You guys, I'm sorry for acting like a dick during the pandemic. I'm sorry too, dude. And this renewed friendship actually completely alters the course of history. Instead of a horrible dystopian future where Stan's mom and sister die in a fire, Butter slings NFTs, Kyle is alone, Stan is an alcoholic, and everything is generally miserable, everybody's life is inarguably better in every way. Well, 
everyone except Cartman, but that's a different story. But isn't it just perfect that this all happened because of Kenny? We've just spent all of this time looking at how Kenny continues to find new ways to help those around him, despite the horrible cards he's been dealt in life, and despite the fact that he has, in general, for his entire life, sort of been taken for granted. And here, because of the deep resentment he felt for his friends because of them taking him for granted, he finds a way not just to help people, but literally change the entire timeline for the better. All of history improves thanks to Kenny's actions, a pretty incredible testament to the character. Kenny's history is so unique. He started as a character who was completely one note, a simple punchline. And as the series went on, he started to develop undeniably positive character traits, slowly becoming a person that was always willing to stand up to protect his friends, to protect the world, and to protect what's right. All of this through the revelation that Kenny is literally cursed to experience countless horrifying deaths dozens of times over, an unfathomably dark existence. And despite this, he maintains his drive to always do what's right to the point where he literally healed the entire world multiple times over. I think it's hard to argue that there's any character who has done more good in South Park than Kenny McCormick. Okay, so I know I just released my definitive Evolution of Kenny video a few weeks ago, and I'm still really proud of how that turned out, but I also sort of just brushed over the Black Friday trilogy and all of the Princess Kenny storyline, chalking it up to escapism. And while I do still think that it's escapism, I actually got a really great comment from YouTube user Sea Shanty with their take on the escapism of Princess Kenny, and I loved it so much it made me want to revisit the entire Black Friday trilogy and Stick of Truth with these ideas in mind, and do a little supplementary Princess Kenny analysis to go alongside my Bigger Kenny video. So, that's what this is. Join me as we explore the escapism of Princess Kenny. So, as a quick recap for my previous Kenny video, the primary arc for Kenny in South Park has lots to do with his role as a protector. Kenny comes from a poor, broken family, and his lower class struggles defined how he was treated for much of his childhood. On top of this, Kenny is cursed with immortality, dying countless times over and over, experiencing every single one, and suffering through the reality that his friends don't remember any of it. As a response to this, Kenny developed an incredibly selfless persona, helping his friends and protecting others in dangerous situations. And this further evolved as he developed the Mysterion persona, a literal superhero alter ego devoted to protecting others. And this all makes a lot of sense. Kenny's rough childhood and immortality curse has to lead to some massive trauma in his life. And creating an outlet to counteract and fight against that kind of trauma perpetuating is one of Kenny's coping mechanisms. But Kenny has another coping mechanism. It's escaping. We see it firsthand in the episode Major Boobage when he gets addicted to cheesing and hallucinates his entire life away. That's a pretty obvious case of escapism, quite literally hallucinating an entirely new reality. But Kenny's escapism into the Princess Kenny role seems to have a direct correlation to that aforementioned protector role that he's foisted upon himself. I mentioned earlier that user C Shanty commented some great analysis that I'm going to use for this video, and here's a little bit of what they said. Yes, Princess Kenny is escapism, but more importantly, she is a completely opposite position from Mysterion. Princesses are meant to be doted on and protected, cared for, catered to, and so in a way, being a princess would be a form of relief for him, because for once, he isn't sacrificing anything or having to shield anyone from harm. And this seems to be exactly what Kenny wants in the entire Black Friday trilogy. One of the issues I had with figuring out Princess Kenny's persona was how it aligns or doesn't align with some of his other behaviors. But that actually seems to be exactly the point. Kenny is normally incredibly kind, protective, and self-sacrificing, nearly to a fault. And through the Black Friday trilogy, we see how Kenny's embracing of the princess role is basically counter to all of those things. As they generally do when they play fantasy games, like in Return of the Fellowship to the Two Towers, they treat the kids and their characters as separate entities. This is also true of Princess Kenny, though Cartman refers to her as Lady McCormick. I need to speak with Lady McCormick. So the big conflict in this trilogy has to do with Cartman's plan to secure next-gen video game consoles through an 80% off clause for the first people to get into the mall on Black Friday. However, the problem is that half of the kids want the Xbox One, and the other half want the PlayStation 4. Initially, Lady McCormick sides with Cartman and Kyle to secure Xbox Ones, but Cartman tells Kenny that they may have to turn on Kyle if things change. All I'm saying is that when the time comes, I might need you to use that influence to have Kyle taken care of. 
But instead, the end of the episode reveals that rather than go along with Cartman's plan, Princess Kenny changes sides entirely, joining Stan and the PlayStation 4 clan, completely reinvigorating and fortifying their forces, effectively becoming their new leader and being treated like royalty. And these moves are all so counter to Kenny's usual MO. Princess Kenny entirely betrayed the team she had allegiance to, despite typically being incredibly loyal, and Princess Kenny basically takes up a role in which people serve her, rather than vice versa, as we usually see with Kenny. Obviously, this is mostly a parody of Daenerys in Game of Thrones, but I still think they make it work for Kenny here, because the opening of the following episode, A Song of Ass and Fire, reveals exactly why she betrayed Cartman. Once a common lady of the Dark Army, but denied my right to be called princess by birth, I betrayed my kind. Cartman refused to let Kenny actually embrace the role of princess, the role that would fully let him fall into that escapism. And so, she changed sides to fully embrace the role of princess, to be doted on and cared for, to not have to be the protector, to be protected herself. And Cartman is incredibly upset by Kenny's betrayal. We are not going to be beat by that traitor whore Kenny! I think Cartman's immense frustrations and his fear over Princess Kenny turning the tides for the PlayStation kids has a lot to do with their shared history, particularly when you look at the Coon and Mysterion stuff. Kenny has always acted as Cartman's foil in the superhero episodes, basically spoiling his entire plan in the original Coon episode and stealing the spotlight, and then of course kicking him out of Coon and Friends and taking over the team in the trilogy. Cartman also sees Kenny as his best friend, so it makes sense that he would be so frustrated and fearful over this betrayal. But of course, one of Cartman's biggest downfalls is his stubbornness. He eventually takes his army to Princess Kenny's kingdom to try and lure them back to their side, obviously because he's worried that they won't manage to secure their Xboxes without the other team's help. But more foolishly, Cartman insults and patronizes Kenny by still refusing to acknowledge her role as princess in the game. Kenny, we all understand wanting to play as the chick once in a while, okay? But you are never going to be a real princess! The entire reason that Princess Kenny swaps sides is because Cartman wouldn't let her be the princess, and despite coming to her asking for help, he still won't acknowledge her that way. But because Kenny was steadfast in her support for the PlayStation, she's rewarded. The president of Sony makes her a literal princess. He offers you this gift to once and for all make you an official princess, and to give you the powers you need to win this war on Black Friday. Despite Cartman claiming he'll never be a real princess, Princess Kenny is now rewarded with the ability to fully embrace the escapism that she desired all along. Wow, Kenny's a Japanese princess. And what I love most about the official Japanese Princess Kenny is that her powers really amount to the influence she holds from being super cute. Matt and Trey talked about this decision on the DVD commentary, that they initially wanted to give Kenny some real powers. And it wasn't until we started episode 3 that we're like, oh no, he shouldn't have any powers, he's just cute. And this, in my mind, is not only funnier, but it once again adds to that sense of escapism that Kenny experiences through this role as Princess Kenny. While Kenny is generally well-liked, in the early days of South Park, he was super overlooked. He was basically a punchline, getting killed constantly, his friends not remembering that he died, and so having one of these Princess Kenny superpowers literally be to completely and influentially win people over through simply being cute is the perfect counter to his earlier role. Princess Kenny is impossible to overlook. She can literally control what other people do and think just by being adorable. He flew down in a parachute and he what? Apparently he stopped Microsoft from blockading the shipment of PS4s to the wall. So this type of superpower, where Kenny cannot be overlooked, and in fact thrives through the ability to be the center of attention, adds a really great layer to that escapism. Complete opposite of Kenny's normal role as unsung hero, the self-sacrificing, selfless protector who doesn't get any of the credit he's owed. And the thing that gets Princess Kenny to finally come back home to South Park from Japan is getting that acceptance from Cartman. Our two houses have found peace. Come to the Red Robin wedding, and we will all accept you as the princess you are. Yours truly, the Wizard King. Though this ultimately does end up being a ruse, as Cartman's entire plan was to lock all of the PlayStation kids in the Red Robin so that they can secure their Xboxes more easily. But the important thing is Kenny's desires here, being accepted by one of his best friends in the role of princess. But in another twist, Kenny, with the help of Kyle, betrays Cartman once again during the Red Robin wedding. And that never-ending back and forth of betrayal, while obviously Game of Thrones inspired, is another piece of the Princess Kenny escapism puzzle. Kenny, as a friend, or as 
as Mysterion, would never betray the people he cared about. In the South Park movie, he gave his life to save his friends. There are countless examples of Kenny throughout the entire history of the show doing the right thing through loyalty and love. But as Princess Kenny, it's all about Kenny. Getting showered in love and attention, being doted on, being cared for, and betraying whoever she wants, when she wants, to get what she wants. Which is why the big finale of the South Park game, The Stick of Truth, also works so well with what we know about Princess Kenny. I actually got a lot of upset comments on my Stick of Truth video about how Kenny's betrayal at the end of the game is so out of character. And you know what? They're not wrong. But I think you have to take two things into account for that betrayal. One, that the first story-based South Park game really wanted to embrace South Park's history in its big finale by making you do one of the most iconic things that the show is known for, killing Kenny. But two, it fits much more when you take into account Kenny's role as Princess Kenny and how that persona is basically the antithesis of everything Kenny is known for, all in the name of escapism. Kenny would never betray all of his friends and fight them, Mysterion would never turn on the people he loved most, but as a coping mechanism for all of the trauma he endured, Kenny created a persona who doesn't have to take on the burdens that he's known for. A character who can be cared for and can do whatever selfish thing they want. Look, I can't say for sure that this is what Matt and Trey intended with Princess Kenny, but when you look at the character's entire history and the role he's taken on throughout South Park, it makes a ton of sense. And I think that it's all a testament to who Kenny really is and what he's endured. It's hard to imagine the kind of trauma that Kenny has experienced, the kind of pressure he's felt in his life, and so it's hard to blame him for escaping into a completely separate entity, one that doesn't have to think about the kinds of hardships and struggles that Kenny has faced. And that is why I love Princess Kenny. Thanks so much to user C Shanty for the comment that inspired this video. You should go check out her channel. She actually does her own animations and they're really cool. And I want to hear what you have to say about Princess Kenny. Do you think this level of escapism makes sense for the character? Let me know below in the comments. And thanks for watching yet another Kenny video. I'm pretty sure this is the last one. Peace. I stay mellow watching Johnny two cellos. He talks cartoons. He's a really cool fellow. He keeps you posted on adult cartoons. If that's what you're into, then grab a spoon and a very big bowl of your favorite cereal. Feels like Saturday morning cartoon material. Johnny Two Chells, watch him on YouTube. Now enjoy this groove and bust a move.